Hello and welcome to Everything EDH. My name is Alonzo. Thank you for having me on as a guest tonight, Nick. And speaking of Nick, I have the commander, Nicobolus the Ravager, here in front of me. It is one of my longest lived decks that I've owned, and I put a lot of work into it. But it started out as just a regular, you know, disruption deck, and it turned into a completely different monster after that. But to give a tour of the commander, Nicobolus the Ravager enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card, and for four in Grixis, you can exile this card and return it to the battlefield transformed under my control at sorcery speed. Now the benefits of that are plenty. So to start with, the plus two ability says draw two cards, minus three, Nicobolus the Risen deals 10 damage to target Creature or Planeswalker. Minus four puts a creature or Planeswalker onto the battlefield under my control from any graveyard. And then the minus 12 basically ends the game for one opponent. Uh, exile all the all but the bottom card of target opponent's library. It's pretty nutty. Or actually it says player, forgive me. So you could even end the game for yourself if you have a you know game ender like Jace, for example, to put into the deck. But instead of that, I decided to make it I would like to call it a smorgasbord of Nicol Bolas. I have all four of the Nicol Bolas Planeswalkers, starting with the Deceiver Planeswalker from the uh, the Arch Enemy set, then Nicol Bolas Dragon God that feeds off all their powers, Nicol Bolas God Pharaoh that is just busted on his own, may even be backbreaking I would say, and then Tezzeret right here I threw in because I have a little bit of art artifact affinity synergy with him being able to summon these big boys out without having to pay the full cost. So that's just back breaking, but if I wanted to end the game quickly, I have several ways of doing that. Well, the first thing is it feeds off of the dual caster mage display slash ghostly flicker combo. Because there's a lot of ETB synergies in this deck, I wanted to add in this combo just in case I wanted to get some card advantage or I wanted to be flexible and drain an opponent of life with Croxa or even Grey Merchant, which is an even better version of that, or option, forgive me. And then we have Gonti to exile all the library, uh, all the cards in each opponent's library if I really wanted to. And then Masker Worm in case there's some kind of uh, trigger from the creatures dying and more tokens being on the battlefield. I can just wipe the, uh, the battlefield on the other opponent's side of the field. I'm out getting the drawer. Oh, move those off to the side. Alright, so in order for me to get to that point, you're going to need some support. So, I use Discard, Disrupt, Drain, and Draw as the four Ds of the deck to get me to that point of ending the game. Starting with Discard, I have Vicious Rumors, which is, I mean, a lot of value for one mana, to be honest with you. So it says, it deals one damage to each opponent, each opponent discards a card, and then puts the top card of the library into the graveyard you gain one life. So it's a lot of effects for just one mana, and I actually love it in this deck, it really helps out. Especially when you have something like Waste Knot on the battlefield. It says, whenever an opponent discards a creature card, put a 2-2 black zombie creature token onto the battlefield. Or whenever an opponent discards a land card, put two or add two black to your mana pool. And the last mode says, whenever an opponent discards a non-creature, non-land card, I get to draw a card. So it just offers so much value Especially with the commander entering the battlefield and making you discard immediately. It just it goes into any discard deck, period. Now to feed into it, other than Vicious Rumors. Thought Erasure. To snipe any cards in the in the opponent's hand that may end up winning them the game. I actually pulled that earlier tonight. Dark Deal to minimize the amount of cards that are in an opponent's hand, including mine as well, but it's a worthy trade, I would say. In case I'm really low on cards, I'll have Jace's Archivist on the battlefield and then repeatedly discard cards until I get the amount or the cards that I want. And then Dark Intimation just kind of feeds into the whole Bolus theme. Whenever I cast a Bolus Planeswalker spell while this is in the graveyard, that Planeswalker enters the battlefield with an additional loyalty counter on it. But the first um, effect it says that each opponent sacrifices a creature or planeswalker, then discards a card. 
I return a creature or a planeswalker card from my graveyard to my hand, then draw a card. I mean, with all the discards that are going on here, and a lot of the times my stuff is dying because people don't want me to have it, that's a really good card to have. It definitely helps me keep the game going. So, now the second D after discard, disrupt. Three cards that everybody hates to see on the battlefield, period. So Ashiok makes it so that way your opponents can't... <laughs> your opponents can't uh, search the library. Nick's making a funny face. Uh, Narset makes it so that opponents can't draw more than one card each turn, which is just backbreaking. Karn turns off all the artifacts, abilities, on your opponent's side of the battlefield. So basically prevents your opponents from wrapping and being able to keep up with Karn advantage. That being explained, for the rest of the disruption, just a bunch of counters, including Power Blast, which is probably a staple in any red deck, to be honest with you, and I have it in every single one of mine. I also have a Drown the Lock to counter something or destroy anything that feeds on the amount of cards that are in the, its controller's graveyard. So especially with the discard and the destruction synergies in this deck, it feeds off of that really well. Uh, commit and memory, or commit to memory, forgive me. Commit makes, uh, puts a target spell or non-land permanent onto its owner's library second from the top, which sometimes if an opponent is going for a game-ending play, then this just stops it long enough for you to be able to figure out something to do to stop it. But while it's in the graveyard, you can cast it at sorcery speed for 4 and 2 blue to make each player shuffle his or her hand and graveyard into the library and then draw 7 cards. So that will get me back in the game in case I'm falling behind and also shut down any uh, plays that players are depending upon, especially in their graveyard. A lot of graveyard hate. I mean, it goes hand in hand with discard, right? But counter, counter, counter. It, there's nothing more to say. Then we also have board wipes. I love feeding on Massacre Girl and Crux of Fate, especially since my commander can transform it at some point. I would want it to stay on for as long as possible, so I would use Crux of Fate for uh, cleaning the board other than him, because everything else is on Dragon in the deck. But Massacre Girl is to clean up any kind of tokens that are laying around, especially when you're playing someone like Nick, who loves tokens so much. Massacre Girl is just completely backbreaking for his kind of deck, and that's why I put it in. Love you, man. So, to further the destruction of the board state, I have Feed the Swarm, which I added to every single black deck that I have. It destroys a creature or an enchantment and opponent controls, and I just lose life equal to the permanent's manual value, but that's an equal trade in my opinion. Uh, Price of Fame kills, I mean, I use it to kill commanders all the time. It just, it costs two less if it targets a legendary creature. I get to destroy it, and I get to look at the top two cards in my library and decide whether or not I want to put it in the graveyard. Tyrant Scorn. Destroy target creature or convert it mana cost three or less, or return target creature to its owner's hand. It's very versatile and extremely disruptive for game uh, ending plays, especially, but also in case your opponents try to keep up with you building your board. And yet again, use that card to great effect tonight, as well as Pongify, which sends a monkey over to your opponent's battlefield to beat up their card. And then Croesus's Charm, which is extremely flexible. You can return a permanent to its owner's hand. Destroy target non-black creature and it can't be regenerated or destroy target artifact. So if something's really pestering you, you can just get rid of it with that card. Which the mana fixing is sometimes difficult for, but you work with what you got. Now drain. So I know that the Elder Spell would feed very well off of my deck, but it, there have been times where it has cleaned up a problem on the other side of the battlefield that I really didn't want to deal with. And I didn't necessarily have anywhere to put the loyalty counters, but it didn't matter. I got rid of the problem. Um, that It's a really flexible card, and people just, you know, use it to build up their one card like I do sometimes. With Mega Balls Dragon God to end the game. But never get rid of that card. <laughs> never going to get rid of that card. Liliana's Caress just really offends my opponent sometimes. It's just absolutely disgusting. Whenever an opponent discards a card, their player loses two life. If you're feeding him too many cards or you're making him discard cards or both, then it's just going to add up really fast. And then Court of Ambition is a more likely way to make that happen. When it's on the battlefield, you become the Monarch. Or when it enters the battlefield, you become the Monarch. And then while it's on the battlefield at the beginning of your upkeep, 
Each opponent loses three life unless they discard a card. And if I kept the Monarchy, then they lose six life instead, unless they discard two cards. And if they only have one card in hand, they lose the six life, it's the bottom line. So I love that card. I'm glad that it came out in the Master set. Not a Masters, forgive me, it was Commander Legends. That's what it was, Commander Legends set. And then we're gonna start off the draw with a card that I don't think many people really know about, or if they do, it's very underutilized. It's Latinom's Legacy, one in the blue, at an instant speed, you can choose a card from your hand and shuffle that card into your library to draw two cards at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. So it's a two for three. And that is a lot of value for, you know, 25 cent card. I literally looked it up. It's only 25 cents. And I have like six of them. <laughs> I passed them out. It's just a great card. Omen of the Sea does the same thing, kind of, except it's an enchantment, which you can turn around and sacrifice later to scry to but when it enters the battlefield you get to scry to and draw a card just more card draw i usually use monastery siege for card draw but sometimes it ends up coming in handy for players that are playing spot removal heavy it'll just prevent them from uh you know being able to target your stuff for two extra mana which actually adds up frantic search which i think uh might be on the list of things that are just busted because it only costs three mana and it it's like a free card, right? You draw two cards, you discard two, discard two cards, and then you untap up to three lands. It's a lot of value for just three mana, and you, you don't even have to really pay for it. You spend the mana, and then it untaps. And sometimes you end up getting a net positive from it. Drawn from Dreams, look through seven cards, pick two. I mean, what can you say about that? Other than Memory Deluge might be a better version of it, because you can cast it twice, when you cast it the first time, you look at the top four and pick two. But if you flash it back from the graveyard, you get to look at the top seven and pick two. So you get 11 cards. Is that the math on that one? 11 cards to look at. I mean, it's a great card. Just Axiom Probe. Pay life or pay a blue. Look at a target player's hand and then draw a card. I mean, yes. Preordain for one blue. Scry two, draw a card. Cantrip. Salon Division. You can look at the top six cards of your library and you reveal an instant or sorcery card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Or you can actually flip it over and play it for a tap blue. And that's very versatile and you need that a lot in these kind of decks with uh, multiple colors. Discovery and Dispersal. So I can either surveil two and draw a card or at instant speed, return a non-land permanent with the hurt Kai's converted mana cost. I screwed that up. Highest converted mana cost among permanents they control to its owner's hand and then discard a card. More discard, more disruption, all in one, draw cards, it's all all of the Ds. Opt. You know what opt is. <laughs> Misha's Bobble. Now this card, when I first saw it, I didn't think to, too much of it, right? But for zero mana, you put it on the battlefield and at instant speed, you can sacrifice it to look at the top card of target player's library and then draw a card. So it's a free card, essentially. And it's, I mean, you get to look at somebody's top card and if they scried something there, then, you know, now you're peeking at what they got going on. It's pretty nice. No wonder it's so damn expensive. This card just came out in the last set. And, I mean, I've only played it twice so far. I mean, once against myself and then once against Nick. When it enters the battlefield or attacks, exile a card from a graveyard. Any graveyard. And I can look at the top card of my library at any time. And that's the really important line there. Because I like to know what's coming around the corner so I can plan ahead. I mean, like Bolas would do. Wouldn't let it just ride out. He'd have plan A, plan B, plan C, all the way down to plan Z past that. And that's exactly what the theme is around this deck, is just knowing what's coming around the corner. And once each turn, I can cast a spell from the top of my library if it shares a card type with a card exile with Cemetery Illuminator. It's just card advantage as well. And, I mean, hate graveyard hate, it's gotta happen. Bale Baleful Strix. When it enters the battlefield, draw a card. It also has flying and death touch. It's a lot of value for only two mana. And then these two cards right here are the main engines of the deck. And once I get them out, it kind of just stops the game completely. Everybody starts focusing on you because every time you cast something, you're either getting card advantage or you're casting it off the top of your library and you're just not stopping. I mean, and it goes hand in hand with... Great Merchant of Asphodel, right? So if I'm able to get that one to bounce multiple times and gain life while casting things on top of my library, it's backbreaking. 
<clears throat> now there's got to be support for this kind of lifestyle is the way I'm going to put it because being evil is a full-time job so to deliver unto evil I love playing this card against everybody because once you think you killed my stuff it's probably coming back but I get to choose up the four target cards in my graveyard if you control a bolus planeswalker return those cards to my hand otherwise an opponent chooses two of them leave the chosen cards in your graveyard and put the rest into your hand and then exile deliver unto evil just give me my cards back in a card and it's bolus themed love it by the way i want to bring this up seb mckinnon is my favorite artist in magic period i'm just going to put that out there love him so beacon of unrest i get to put that uh bolus of citadel you thought you got rid of back onto the battlefield or a creature from any graveyard that nobody wants back and then i get to put this back in my library it's not going anywhere love that card Search a card, Diabolic Tutor, if for extremely budget prices, because I'm not spending money on a vampiric rights. <laughs> Ley Line of Anticipation, if you thought it was bad at sorcery speed, making it into speed is probably going to be even worse. That's the reason why it's in here. Elixir of Immortality, I mean, give me my graveyard back. And only mine. Everybody else gets to, you know, suffer. Library of Lang, just in case I'm drawing too many cards, now I don't have to care. If I'm discarding cards because of my own effect, I don't have to care. Love this card. Planebound Accomplice. So, all those high value planeswalkers that we looked at earlier, that cost 8 mana, 7 mana, 6 mana. Yeah, you want to play them for 1 red, this is the card you want to use, right? It's literally, you just pay 1 red at any point of any turn. And I could put a Planeswalker card from my hand onto the battlefield and sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. So picture, you're at the end step of the person to your right, or whatever turn order you're going with. And on their end step, you activate this four times and put down four of those bombs. You have them for that next turn, and then hopefully you win by that point. Because, I mean, come on, what can you do at that point? It's great. Nightscape Familiar just brings down the price of everything. For blue and red spells specifically, let me put that out there, which is kind of a bummer because it itself is black. I wish it did black, but whatever. And then Thassa and Mirage Phalanx do somewhat of the same thing. They trigger extra ETBs for creatures that I have. Uh, Mirage Phalanx is temporary. Thassa just blinks the card. And on top of that, this one can tap another target creature for three and a blue. It's also indestructible. Now, my mana base is kind of whack. I'm just going to put that out there. Starting with the mana rocks, I just got three. That's it. I got Soul Ring, Thought Vessel, and Mind Stone. They're all colorless, but they're all low cost, low curve. This uh, Mind Stone could actually draw cards. Thought Vessel prevents me from having to discard. I mean, Soul Ring, every deck. Period. Right? It doesn't matter how much your commander costs. Just put it in there. Then I have some special lands. One of which I wanted to bring up for Nick. <laughs> Because he loves it so much. Halimar Depths. Now, every blue deck that I have, period, plays that card. And the reason why is because I get to look at the top three cards in my library and put them back in any order. So if it's my first draw, my first turn, and I'm playing this, then I have three cards deep to look at to know what I'm going to do next. And that's just amazing, especially in a deck with such a low uh, mana cost. I can actually turn it into a chain of cards rather than just the one card and go oops I screwed up so definitely worth the price which is only like 19 cents <laughs> super budget every command tower in every commander deck exotic orchard Nick actually gave this to me as a gift add to your mana pool one mana of any color that a land an opponent controls can produce just makes it easier to cast things in your in your library in case you're running out of stuff to do. Sulfur Falls. Taps are blue to red. Smoldering Marsh, blue or black. Smol or Dragon Skull Summit. Those are the only cards other than Command Tower and Exotic Orchard that actually tap for multiple colors in this deck. The rest of them either have to be filters or they're for a special purpose. Ash Barons is just a mana fix. Reliquary Tower, no maximum hand size. And Interplayer Beacon. In case I wanted to cast a Planeswalker and I don't have the right mana, this actually does filter two mana, which is nice. I mean, they all tap for colorless, but those are the only three colorless lands in the deck. Actually, no, sorry, there's one more. 
But Bajoka Bog, for any graveyard hate deck, you gotta have it in there. But I also have four artifact lands to go with the synergies with Tezzeret. They're artifacts, obviously, but they also add to the artifact count, which there's a slight lack of in the deck. So this makes up for it and definitely makes it easier to, you know, break some backs. Also, I really love the Cita sign out. It's a beautiful art. And then after that, there's just 20 basic lands. If I'm not mistaken, there's five mountains, there's seven islands and eight swamps. And shout out to Nick for getting me these old school fourth edition swamps a long time ago to go in that first deck. Really love them. I still use them to this day. Special thanks to Alonzo for showing off his Nickel Bolas deck. If you're thinking about making this deck or just want to use it for inspiration, so has included a link to the deck list below. Do you want a chance to come on Everything EDH and show off your unique builds like Alonzo did, or just want to see it talked about on video? Consider becoming a Patreon. You can get more details by following the links below. Thanks again for watching, and as always, my fellow wizards, stay foil.